to build uh, AI-first products that provide magical experiences to users. So let's talk a bit about AI. There's a lot of hype going on. There's a lot of uh, things being written about it. Uh, and a lot of people have very strong opinions about it just being a fad, about it adding actual value. So it, it ranges from people who say it's become a meaningless term uh, in tech uh, that is just synonymous with some algorithm uh, underneath. And even studies that show that two-fifths of startups in Europe that call themselves AI startups have no evidence of having an AI product. And on the other side, you have those saying that this can help us solve climate change, that this can help us solve some of the harder problems that humanity is facing. So without going in the detail of defining if we're talking about machine learning or some special algorithms and leaving it a bit vague at AI, I would define the outcome that people are usually thinking when they're talking about this, which is the type of experiences that have changed how people interact with technology and go about doing their daily business. The pain it is when you cannot call an Uber and have to call a cab when you go to a place that doesn't have Ubers or cabs lying around. It's because it's your experience of going from A to B has been transformed by technology. When you unlock your phone with uh, face recognition and suddenly um, you cannot do that because you wear a hat, for example, it creates some friction to, uh, to your expectations, to, to, to how you got used to things being so simple, so magical. Even Siri, she gets it wrong a lot of times, but sometimes when it works, it feels like, wow. So it's about those magical experiences, and it's about using some form of advanced technology that helps us get there. And what I will talk about is why this is not so easy to do, and what are some reasons for that and some ways around it, and some experience we've had at Fidzai building products with an AI-first uh, approach, and what does that entail? So, if we all want to be creating magical experiences, and that's the end state, first we need to examine where we're at as an industry. And a lot of tech today, it's about a backlog, tickets, going, moving to the next thing, one more feature, one more ticket. Oh, the sprint burn down is great. We just released more stuff. We're providing so much value to our end users. But are we? We often lack the measurement at the end. And it's become, in many ways, uh, driven by the dominance of agile feature factory work, where it's just like a pile of things being dumped on the user's lap, and he'll figure out how to use it, and what value does that bring. And it's important to examine how we got here. So agile started getting popular with Scrum in particular, and started spreading right about after the dot-com crisis and the bubble bursts that was motivated by a new type of technology, the internet, the connectiveness of, of that internet brought, disrupting or trying to disrupt how business is done, but nobody knowing how to set up a proper business model for it. And then people got cautious. They were a little burned with it, so they wanted methods that give us more validation, earlier testing, validating what we're doing, trying to do it step by step and iteratively. And that's not a bad thing, that's a great thing. But it brought us to where we are today. And with emergent technology, like the internet, like AI, the problem is how do you move from what you're used to to the true power of what it can enable? This ship, it's one of the first steamships ever built. Uh, it's called Savannah. And it was famous because it crossed the Atlantic. It was the first steamship to cross the Atlantic. You look at it, it looks very strange. It has indeed a steam engine in the middle that powers the wheel. But it also has sails, because that's how ships were built. So this is a kind of a figuring out how we add this technology to an existing concept, to a legacy product. This is engine inside, 
You go from pre-engine to engine inside. And that's the metaphor that I'm talking about applied to AI. We often are building just at AI, uh, AI inside, really cool features. So you might have a new feature on your photo app that removes uh, people uh, in the background and just does some smart blurring in the background. But it is still a photo app. You still need to do a certain number of tasks to get to a photo, and you just have this gimmicky thing on top. What would be a AI first photo app? Well, surely it cannot also be automating the whole process. Otherwise, if the camera takes the pictures and people don't do anything, what is it good for? Uh, so if you take that analogy and look back, at some point, pictures were looked upon, photography uh, were, was looked upon as not an art, because a true art requires effort, and only painting was an art. Then, if you follow the evolution of photography, you see that a lot of people were like, oh, digital cameras, no, no. For it to be real photography, you need to do the revelation yourself on film. Uh, and then you get to point and shoot, and people are taking great pictures with iPhones. Is it a great picture or not? So there's a lot of this that is not about the technology, it's about the people and how they use it and what are they willing to accept and how they perceive uh, the part that is done by the machine versus the part that is done by the human. Another interesting thing when you consider emerging technologies in AI is another concept that has been popularized a lot and used very poorly and very wrongly uh, recently, uh, which is minimum viable products. People now ship intermediate products and call them minimum viable products. But if, even if we go at the core of the definition, by Reid Hoffman, who founded uh, LinkedIn, it's about being willing to be a little embarrassed because your product is not polished, because otherwise you're launching too late. How embarrassed would you be willing to be about the quality of your product if we're talking about a self-driving car where the person cannot drive the car? What if it fails just a bit? Um, what about if it's a, a robot that performs brain surgery autonomously? How embarrassed can you be about the quality of product you're shipping? Uh, or anything that deals with people's lives, is essentially. AI brings a lot of power to be able to do these things. So it requires this thought process of what is good enough and where are we putting our quality checks? And it's definitely not in building incremental features until you have the feature set that works. So fundamentally, <coughs> designing AI first, starting with AI, is about the roles and boundaries of what humans do and what machines do. And I'll get back to this. So if we're not doing it with Agile, or at least not only with Agile, uh, then what methodologies are there? How can we approach this? There is no exact playbook, but there are some things we can take inspiration from and try to apply to this field. So one of the best uh, books on innovation, it's more focused on the business side uh, of innovation, is The Innovator's Dilemma. And it contrasts two types of innovation. The sustaining innovation, Agile is great for this. You get 10% better iterative increments. You use customer feedback, a cycle of validation, a cycle of testing to figure out what actually will keep them happy uh, and you keep delivering on that progressively. And that will make sure that you essentially capture the value of your products. Make sure that you get the money's worth of your products from your installed base or potential client base in the market you're operating. If you want to enter new markets, if you want to do things that take more risk but might have higher payout, then you should have a disruptive approach. You should think about uh, how do we try things that might fail and accept that failure and keep trying. 
And this is not about going and ask customers what they want. This guy, uh, his name is Steven Sanson, and he built the first digital camera, or at least one of the first, uh, back in the late 70s. And at the time, Kodak was the market leader, and they were one of the technology leaders of that age. They were the Google of their time. It was with Kodak cameras that the photos in the Apollo mission were taken. There were close to 40 million uh, units sold uh, of film cameras around the time that that first digital camera was actually uh, created. And then it went down. Actually, correction, 20 years before was when the camera was created, the digital camera. They were still rising at the time. They got to, in 97, to the, the number I said, and then it went down. And why did it went down? Because digital cameras appeared. So, and if you plot that, you see that it's just an order order of magnitude, it completely squashes the previous curve. And that one is also going down, we'll get there. But what's interesting is that Steven worked at Kodak. He worked on their labs, on their R&D, and it was the business execs that didn't get that they had to place these bets, these alternative bets, because they were too afraid of losing the film market where they were also selling the film uh, to take the cameras. I don't know if the audience is old enough to remember you had to put film on the camera uh, for those type of cameras. And um, yeah, they wouldn't approve it. Uh, you're going to cannibalize our core markets. Uh, let's not do it. And that's the sad story of Kodak. And of course, who takes pictures with cameras anymore? We have smartphones. So going back to how does this, how can we apply these lessons from disruptive innovation and avoid the path that Kodak take and steer emergent technology like AI that has huge capability but also some, some risks towards success, uh, successful products, successful interactions that users get in the end. It's about defining the jobs that users get to keep doing and the jobs that they're willing uh, and accepting of letting machines do. So let me give you some examples of this from our work at Fitzai. Uh, what we've built uh, generically is essentially a machine learning platform to score risk and prevent fraud and financial crime. And this is the problem we're tackling. This number is almost doubling. Uh, the projected number for 2023 is 43 billion. And that's just card fraud. There's many other types of financial fraud. Uh, if you look at the estimated uh, volume of money in circulation in uh, money laundry, uh, it's, some estimates go to the trillions. So those are huge problems to solve and problems that are not that easy to solve. And the way we approached it from the start was about, and this has to do with the nature of machine learning, which is a form of AI. You need to have the human in the loop. You need to have manual validation so that the system can continue to learn about uh, what's not normal behavior. So we introduced this into a market a few years ago, five, six years ago when people were used to dealing just with rules, just people that know about fraud and simple if then else rules. And they had to cope with not understanding fully what's going on. There is no machine learning model taking decisions for you. But part of the deal that worked for them and worked for the machine was that you're still in the loop. You still have to review the edge cases. You still have to give us some feedback on how the machine is doing. And that actually feeds perfectly with how uh, the machine learning models work. They need feedback. So that was just more context. Now diving deep into two recent stories of products we launched, where we applied some of the innovation toolbox uh, 
that we've collected of different methods to try to achieve a 10x type of experience. Always looking to change how things are doing by at least an order of magnitude or a multiplier factor and not a percentage increment. And how these things also connect with our AI first vision. So, AutoML. It's quite an interesting topic because it's about automating what the data scientists that use the machine learning are doing. So you already have machine learning automating what the fraud analysts were doing. Now you're going to automate what the maintainers of the, uh, of the AI do themselves. The good thing about this uh, problem is that few people have tried it before, and they haven't applied it to our space. So we took inspiration from that. So one thing we do is we keep tabs on what others are doing in our space. This is something product managers, data science managers, engineering managers are constantly sharing internally. So we, we had a look at that, investigated what uh, H2O, for example, uh, does on, uh, on driverless AI. Uh, and got some inspiration for how we could do it differently, apply to the financial space, to the domain we know best. And then we mapped internally, because we have data scientists internally, so they are both the builders and the users of the product. And we also have them at clients, so we interviewed them and we understood what matters for them, what are the pain points, and what can be automated. Where are they adding most value, and what is harder to assess with existing technologies? And then we, we went after those things, those quick wins. And where we got at is that a model that is trained just with raw data has a very uh, weak performance in this type of charts. You want the curve to be as close to the bottom uh, left corner uh, as possible. A model designed carefully by two data scientists working for two months gives you a, a much nicer curve. And we were able to build something that is very close to that, that only takes one person working a day with the machine to achieve together. And this was something that the data scientists actually appreciated because they realized it's less uh, monotonous work and they can be acting on models for different clients, for different problems, for different solutions with less effort put in. We also understood where to take the product next. What users are willing to let go that we haven't tackled that yet is data cleaning. Nobody likes the, doing data cleaning. And uh, Newsflash is more than 50% of the data scientists job a lot of times. So by understanding what the users are willing to let go of and what they value and what they would like automated and by applying the right technology, we were able to shift the understanding between the, the deal between the human and the machine with this product. And we have a really nice business impact out of it as well. Another product um, we've worked on recently where we also brought a series of methods and going outside the feature factory daily work and trying to think of how do we do these things uh, in a more Accepting the possibility of failure, essentially. Accepting that this might not work out was this product, Genome. It has nothing to do with spinning things, but I really like the visual. Um, so the way that the analysts are working is they're looking at lists of things and trying to map which ones are related to which ones. Um, so there's a lot of looking at different lists and cross, crossing information and trying to identify common patterns and this is really uh, a skill they've developed, and it's really uh, tiring to do, and it takes time to sometimes spot less obvious patterns, where things are only connected by two orders of uh, common entities and things of the sort. So we started investigating, again, what some competitors have done and what has been done in other industries around using graphs to understand patterns of behavior between different entities. 
and we started debriefing internally in our network uh, who knew about this type of tools and this type of solutions and approaches. And then we moved to, we also reviewed the competitors, and then we moved to setting up a cross-functional task force, staffing it with data scientists that know how we might tackle this from an AI perspective, uh, fraud analysts that we have internal that understand how fraud works and that have been users of this type of products, and data visualization experts that understand how to uh, illustrate complex networks visually and illustrate data visually. And we sketched. That's actually, uh, if you notice the coffee down there, we had a whiteboard working as a table, and we were just drinking coffee and sketching and, and riffing off each other and trying to come up with some, some ideas of what this might look like. And then we did some low fidelity prototypes and how we test with engineers. And then we went for, wait, yeah. Then we went, this was a very important step. Uh, it was taken to a hackathon that we were running internally. The people from the task force said, this is what I want to work on the hackathon. Um, so they had a few days to play with, uh, with the topic. Uh, and on top of that, they prepared the data set that was anonymized and it was real. So it's when you stop guessing about some of, some of these things and you start data first. Put the data there and see what it renders and then you can iterate on what's the best way to look at it. They actually went to win the hackathon. This was last year. Uh, because it was the, 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 one of the coolest projects there. Uh, there are many winners, there are different categories. This was the top project. And what happened next is we actually started a customer development program uh, with several customers that were willing to give it a, a try to this and letting us use it with their data and explore it and uh, get feedback from their analysts. So we're consuming a lot of their time with this for a product that they're not actively using, but they see the value of the proposition of what it can achieve. Um, and it helped us shape the product. Uh, we applied design sprints. We tailored it to our, uh, to our needs and to our team and how we should fit it uh, in our context. And this is just some examples. This was sprint number four of a, of a set of sprints where we learned something. We were trying to, to illustrate uh, visually what, which, has, which entities have been marked as fraud in the past. It was not very clear for some users. We tried something else, we failed again, but failed better, learned again, and eventually we got to something that uh, it applied to this use case in this client better. Um, so, it's something where, again, understanding what the users are willing to let go of and what they want to keep. They want to keep the decision, they want to keep the final analysis, but if they have the data structured in a way that they can interpret it better and faster and look at different edge cases, they will move to this. Not all of them. That was another learning. More senior um, experts that just do fraud, have done fraud for years, were much more excited about this than the junior guys. The junior guys were confused. They were like, uh, graph, uh, I want my table. Okay? So there is also, that's also something you learn. Where do you position the innovation toward, who do you position it towards, and how do you structure and learn from that and evaluate which direction to take it? This is just a fancy visual of the product in action. We really like this product. We've had clients say they would marry the product. That is a true quote. I have it on tape. I cannot show you the tape, but I do have it on tape. Um, and what's next? So we started AI first. We didn't actually develop anything that uses an algorithm or machine learning in this product. I still consider it an AI first product because we had data scientists and AI experts from the start. We evaluated the deal between users and what innovation we're bringing. And we considered how are we setting it up to add the functionality powered by AI in the next stage. So in the next stage, we'll be able to tell them Here's some similar graphs to this graph. 
This was fraud in the past. What kind of fraud do you think this is? Help us categorize this. We have lots of ideas of how we're doing that. They're already in, the, in our R&D for the next phases. And it was because we had that mindset from the get-go of what can we do with this and what will users accept and not accept. And we use that through our discovery with the users to refine that concept and refine that understanding. So, questions? Uh, do we have microphones? Sorry. You are too fast. People usually... Thank you. Uh, my name is Constantine. Um, I would like to know more about your, how you're doing hackathons. Uh, so, and my question is, do you want to uh, place uh, such anonymized data to a platform like Kaggle? It will be in very interesting because you will receive a lot of side views to your data uh, and your new approach. I think it will be interesting. So do you have any plan about this? I have another question. <laughs> so I can talk a bit about the hackathons, about Kaggle. I'm not sure if we have had in the past. Yeah. We have. <laughs> Um, but uh, just come by our boot and we can talk about a bit about what we have on Kaggle. Um, about hackathons, uh, what we've done uh, twice uh, last year and we're planning again this year um, was a 48 hours uh, period, so basically two days, where people in the company can work on whatever idea they want. They just get together and hack on what they want. Um, it's something that requires some pre previous setup so and some internal selling even to the staff because people are it's confusing, what is a hackathon? Uh, uh, so we clear those two days, we, we ensure that there are no commitments in terms of roadmap, in terms of deliverables uh, in that period. Uh, it's not always possible for all teams, but uh, we do it for, uh, I would say, most, most teams. Uh, we've had a lot of, lot of uh, interest internally. People really enjoyed it. Uh, and then we give some awards to just uh, showcase and reinforce what we like. Oh, sorry to interrupt you. Do you use any approach that you are finding during hackathons on your live circles? Yes. So we changed our uh, analytics stack because of a hackathon. It was a major change. We developed these two products uh, the first one was more clearly in the hackathon. The other one kind of bubbled up during the hackathon uh, as well. Uh, there was, I think, two or three other product improvements that actually came out of hackathons. Congratulations. So. And one more question. Uh, uh, normally, uh, any uh, model prediction is a black box. So you don't know why such predictions came out. So if you use some regression model, boosting tree, it's more, more, more or less predictable, but when you use neural networks, it's more black box. Do you have any internal instruments to do um, uh, uh, model introspection and yes. uh, interpretation of the results that you are using, uh, that you are receiving yes. du du during, during your models preparing? And how you, wh what kind of these instruments are you using? So. We started with uh, random forest algorithms exactly to bypass this problem because they're white boxable. Um, we've uh, implemented a lot of other algorithms, integrated other algorithms from external platforms. And we use either surrogate models already uh, or surrogate rules to kind of do explainability for that. We're also looking into using Lime as an algorithm that seems to apply to a variety uh, of models, including uh, more black box approaches. That's currently in development, actually. Thank you. Welcome. Any other questions? Anybody here for the raffles, for the Bose headphones and uh, NOS tickets? OK. Let's see if you got it. So now I'm going to use an AI first product to randomize the choice of the ticket that's going to win. <laughs> it's very new technology. I haven't used it for this purpose before. 
So let's see if it works. There is no manual for this. It's like AI first. Is it the both first? Yeah. Joana Pinto. Joana Pinto around? Data science. No? Okay. So the blue headphones goes to Joana Pinto. She will be contacted later. All right. And now Noz alive. Yeah. Gustavo Pereira Oliveira. No? Yeah, we'll contact Gustavo later as well for the Nozzle Live tickets. <laughs> Sorry to disappoint the crowd that actually stayed. <laughs> Hope you enjoyed it. If you like to learn more, also just come by, by the booth. If there's any question to finalize, we're happy to answer that as well.